Hi, everyone. We're so excited to have you here tonight with us um, at our Hogue Healing um, virtual event. Um, welcome to everybody who's joined us in the past and very much welcome to all the new patients that are um, joining us tonight. So our event is a little bit different tonight where we are trying to pick speakers and uh, topics that would be applicable to our breast cancer survivors um, and also to ovarian cancer survivors. So for anyone new who's joined us, um, we're super excited to have you here tonight. My name is uh, Dr. Sadia Khan. I'm a fellowship trained breast surgeon and I um, help run the survivorship program here at Hogue. Um, we have a wonderful team of um, providers and wellness um, providers that make up the entire team that's Hogue Healing that makes it possible to have um, these wonderful events. So we really hope you enjoy um, the talks tonight. Um, we would love to get your feedback on the speakers tonight, as well as anything else that you'd be interested in hearing about. Uh, we try to do these events quarterly. So if you did register, hopefully you'll get emails and reminders for any of our upcoming events. All of the events are recorded um, and kept on the Hogue Health YouTube channel. So if you miss part of the event and you wanna go back and watch it, you should be able to find it on the Hogue Health YouTube channel. And anything, if you just search under Hogue Healing, all of our previous events should show up. So if you wanna go back and kind of see what other topics have been covered. Um, anybody who's registered will also get a email blast, um, which is kind of like a great newsletter. It includes um, a small snippet from each of our speakers today about tips on their particular topics and also um, has like reminders of some of our upcoming events. And most importantly, it has a very, very brief survey that I would love and appreciate for you to fill out. Um, it helps us understand, you know, what you might be looking for in these future events um, and it gives you an opportunity to make suggestions. So please look out for that. Um, email blast and fill out uh, the survey. It should only take a couple of minutes. Um, also mark your calendars for our next event. So we'll have an event in the summer. It's um, dated for June 9th. It's another virtual event, um, unless things change until then, but for now it's virtual. Um, so we'll have another um, two speakers. We have a, a sleep specialist. I know lots of patients um, have requested that. So we have a wonderful sleep specialist that's gonna talk to us about helping, um, you know, tips to go to sleep and insomnia and issues like that. And we also have a dietitian um, that's going to give us a wonderful talk about cancer fighting foods um, and recipes. So look out and mark your calendar for June 9th and you will get email blast and reminders about it. So we have two wonderful speakers. I'd love to introduce them and give you their bios and then we'll go right into the talks. Um, also, another quick reminder is that we want tonight to be very interactive. So please submit any questions that you have for our speakers. They're here and they would love to answer any of your questions. Um, so if you enter them into the chat box, we'll get them and at the end of the event towards, um, you know, once we've done the talks, we'll open up for any questions that you guys have. Um, so our two wonderful speakers are here. First is Dr. Heather McDonald. She's the medical director of our um, high-risk breast and ovarian cancer program. She's also assistant clinical professor at USC and part of our breast fellowship. She is an OBGYN that specializes in the treatment of breast diseases. And she's a gynecologist by training and an expert in managing menopause. So she's gonna give us an awesome talk and give you some tips on how to manage all of the issues that go with menopause that don't involve hormones. So um, our next speaker is um, Amy Holcomb. She's from Chicago and lives in Manhattan Beach. For over 20 years, she's been practicing Pilates um, and um, understands the tremendous benefit it has on the body, as well as with healing, I'm sure with related to our cancer patients. Um, so Amy has an associate's um, of art degree and applies her artistic skills and to various design projects in her spare time. And she enjoys outdoor seasonal sports. So we're really excited to have Amy here. She's gonna give us a great fitness demonstration. 
um, later um, in, in our event. So um, I'd like to invite Dr. McDonald to go ahead and give us your wonderful tips on menopause. And just a reminder to everybody who's joining us tonight, please write down your questions in the chat box um, for both of our speakers. Take it away, Dr. McDonald. Thank you so much, Dr. Khan, and thank you for the invitation to talk about this. Um, I am, like she said, an OBGYN by training. Um, I also am a breast surgeon, and most of my surgical practice is now taking care of breast cancer, but the part of gynecology that I've held on to is exactly what we're going to talk about tonight, because I think for cancer survivors, this can be confusing, um, and there's a lot, a lot of things available to help manage it. People feel like, oh, you just have to tough it out, and that's not really true. I am not going to talk about hormonal management of menopause tonight because for cancer patients, that can be a little complicated and is really a conversation that's best had with your individual doctor about your exact tumor and your exact treatment and, um, and how to manage that. So this is gonna focus on non-hormonal management. What are the options that are not hormones that are available to patients um, and cancer survivors to manage these um, can be really bothersome symptoms. Next slide. So I don't have any disclosures. Um, I am gonna mention some products tonight that I and my patients have found helpful, but I wanna be clear, this is not an endorsement by either USC or Hogue. Um, this is just uh, uh, things that have been helpful to other people in the past um, and actually in my current practice. So next slide. Okay, so menopause, has sort of two pieces to it. There's the cultural definition, but there's also a medical definition. So to us uh, clinicians, menopause is when your ovaries stop making hormones. And for most women that naturally happens in her late forties, early fifties. However, it can in cancer patients often happen as part of treatment, either chemotherapy, radiation, or surgery. Um, we define menopause as when that monthly cycle stops. Um, and you transition to a different phase of life. Biochemically in your body, your levels of hormones fall. Um, importantly, again, for our cancer survivors, often this is, occurs as a part process of treatment, and therefore the symptoms can be a little more severe, and we're gonna talk about that. Next slide. So it also fills a real cultural space. This is one of my favorite definitions of menopause, the period in a woman's life when men have to pause before they talk. Uh, because there's a lot of cultural attitudes and norms around menopause and actually a lot of myths around menopause. So I'm going to try and address them both. Next slide. This is one of my favorite sort of humorous approaches that this is a time in life where a woman doesn't know she's coming or going. She's on fire or she's freezing. She wants to diet and eat everything in sight. And there's a lot of potentially wine, chocolate, ice cream, internet searching going on. So it really is a real transition in women's lives. Next slide. However, what really do we know about women at midlife? There's a lot of myths going around about what, what does this entail, but what when we look at this scientifically, what do we know? So first of all, the idea that women go through a midlife crisis is really not supported. So when you pull large women, numbers of women in our population, about 80% say they don't de experience any drop in their quality of life around their midlife. So the myth it's a myth that menopause has to be miserable. In fact, most women report that this is one of the happiest times of their life, and it might be for professional accomplishments, for personal fulfillments. It might be the relationships in their lives that they've invested time in are really stable. Um, a lot of women at this point in their life kind of say they've hit their stride. However, midlife can be a time of stress. There can be financial stresses. Relationships can start to change as children may grow up and leave the house or parents and in-laws start to age and women become caretakers of other, um, of other family members. So it can also be a, a period of real transition. However, about 10% of women report it's really difficult. They report despair, irritability, and exhaustion. So there is definitely something there that we need to look at. Next slide. Okay, so I'm gonna start with the first myth, which is everyone gains weight at menopause. And actually, this is a myth. The truth is most women do not. However, this is key. Fat distribution changes in the body and women tend to go from what is considered sort of a more pear-shaped way to carry weight, where most of the weight may be in the hips and the legs, to a more apple-shaped distribution of weight where there is much more fat around the abdomen. And this is why women commonly say, but my clothes don't really fit anymore. 
and but their weight may not have changed. It's the distribution of weight that has changed. The other things that are true are lean body mass starts to diminish starting at the age of 30. So I'm going to give a little plug for the fitness video you're going to see in a few minutes. It's really important at this time in life that women pay attention to maintaining their muscle mass. Our lifestyles tend to become more sedentary as we age. Many of us move in careers from careers that had us moving around to careers that have or maybe more managerial or certainly more computer related. And then I do want to stress the importance of sleep. This is a time of life where women can be really sleep deprived for various reasons. And we're going to talk about that. But there are many studies that connect um, weight with lack of sleep. The less you sleep, the more you may gain weight. So for all these reasons, menopause gets a bad name. It's when you gain weight. It may not necessarily be true, and it may not actually be at all true about the hormonal shifts. It may be more about sort of the lifestyle changes that happen at this time of life. Next slide. Okay, and what about special considerations for our audience today? If you're a cancer survivor, you have found your menopausal symptoms, if they started during treatment, to be on the more severe side. So menopause is supposed to be a natural process that occurs over, we think about five to seven years of ovaries slowly shutting down their, their hormone production. And for many cancer patients, they didn't get that five to seven year transition. Either chemotherapy put them into menopause within a matter of months, or surgery may have put them into menopause in the, within the matter of minutes. But we know that the severity of menopausal symptoms can relate to how quickly a patient was thrown into menopause, meaning for our cancer survivors, um, often their, their symptoms can be more severe. Um, and then there's a lot of concern about treating those symptoms because specifically breast cancer, um, but also certain types of ovarian cancer are hormonally driven tumors Patients may be, and their doctors may be nervous about treating their menopausal symptoms, but we have data that not treating those symptoms is as detrimental to her as it might be adding some of those hormones. So that's what we're talking about today is what can we do to improve quality of life? Next slide. Okay, so seven stages of menopause. There's certainly mood disturbances. We talked about maybe some weight gain, some sleep issues, some memory issues. Next slide. So the initial phase of menopause, which happens in the first couple years, is the trifecta of hot flushes, sleep disturbances, and mood changes. So these are women who are alternating hot and sweaty or cold, maybe either can't fall asleep at night or more commonly have no problem falling asleep on the couch at 8 p.m., but when they get woken up by a hot flush at 2 a.m., they never get to go back to sleep. And then moodiness, serious moodiness, significant moodiness, friends are complaining, families complaining, sometimes even the patient herself is saying, who am I and what happened? So we know that about half of women in midlife have insomnia and have sleep issues. Like I mentioned, hot flushes can create those sleep issues. It can be the thing that wakes people up at night and then once they're awake, they can't go back to sleep. We all know that sleep deprivation can cause all kinds of mood changes, memory problems. It's really hard to concentrate when you've been awake since 1.30 in the morning. Mood symptoms also can start early in this menopausal process as cycles become irregular. So mood symptoms may actually be the first sign of all of this. And a quick comment that if a, a woman has had a mood disorder previously, specifically around hormonal changes. So I'm gonna call out postpartum depression. If a woman has gone through a mood disorder previously at midlife or at menopause, when she's going through hormonal changes again, they may come back up. So it's something to keep in mind if you've had a mood disorder previously, make sure you've mentioned that to your doctor and proactively manage it because even if it's been under good control for a couple of years, it may come back up. Next slide. Okay, so how do we treat this? You know, women walk into our office, they're kind of a sweaty, tired, moody mess. And what can we do? So as a doctor, I always start with which symptom is worse. Let's start with one thing. What is the thing that's disturbing your life the most? Is it the hot flushes that are making you crazy? Is it, I could sleep through the night, but the hot flushes are waking me up? Is it that you're, that you're really moody? Are you just moody because you're tired? If you're moody because you're having a mood disorder, we'll start with that. But if it's really the insomnia, let's treat that and see if your mood improves. Again, a comment, if you had a mood disorder previously, this is often when we need to treat it again. And then a comment again about sleep, um, the importance of sleep is if insomnia is chronic, meaning for more than several months of more than three nights every week, 
for a couple months in a row, then you really need a formal sleep um, evaluation because there are many things that can interrupt sleep. Obviously things get put on menopause, but sometimes there's actually an underlying sleep disorder. Next slide. Okay, so what can we do once you've kind of figured out what is the thing that is really making you craziest, what can you actually do about it? So lifestyle changes, we talk about them all the time. They're actually really powerful if you can motivate yourself to do them. So for women who are overweight, if you can achieve a healthy weight, and I realize that that can be a complicated process, but if you can get your weight down to a healthy weight, you actually can significantly improve your hot flushes. The other thing for breast cancer survivors is if you are overweight and you can get back to a healthy weight, you drop your risk of breast cancer recurrence. So that's a really important thing to keep in mind. Um, high, uh, low fat, high fruit and vegetable diet is also sort of um, supportive of lowering hot flushes. Daily exercise is associated with, with shorter hot flushes and fewer of them. Um, and that the key there is daily. So there's something about the regularity of exercise, even if it's only 15 minutes or so most days a week, it's that regular occurrence that really shows the benefit. So saving all your physical activity till a Saturday is not going to show um, any benefit here. But if you can do it religiously and regularly, all the studies have shown that hot flushes will be reduced by severity and frequency by about 50%. So that's pretty impressive. One caveat, though, when you're actually doing exercise, if it's strenuous, you may trigger a hot flush. So you may notice that you're sweatier as you're doing your boot camp on the beach or as you're spinning on your Peloton. But if you can keep it up, overall, the trend will improve. Things to really pay attention to, and I know this seems really unfair, but especially at bedtime, caffeine, alcohol, and spicy foods, they all can trigger hot flushes. So if nighttime sweats is a problem, I, I know we all like to end the, the day potentially with our, our uh, cappuccino or our direct, direct glass of wine, um, but we do, do need to make that connection. So one way you do it for yourself is keep a diary of what, how it is, what you're drinking and eating late at night, and how your sleep is and how your hot flushes are, and then put that together if that's a problem in your life. Nicotine can cause the same effect. So reason number 850 why if you are smoking, best thing you could do for yourself is find a way to quit. For people who do have issues with nighttime uh, sleeping or hot flushes, pay attention to sleep hygiene. So your bedroom should be quiet. You should have a regular nightly ritual and it's key. It needs to start at the same time every night. Your body, we are creatures of habit. Your body needs to be in the habit of getting ready to go to bed with lots of cues like dimming lights, calming music, maybe a, a cool bath or a cool shower at night but some routine ritual where your body gets clued in, this is how we go to bed now. And that will substantially improve your ability to fall asleep and stay asleep. Keeping that bedroom cool and dark will help tolerate the night sweats um, and help you to keep from waking up from them. And just a, a comment, bedrooms should be for bedroom activity and sleeping. So screens should be out of the bedroom, lights should be low, even on your phone that they block the blue light and it's supposed to not keep you awake, that is marketing. Screens should be out of the bedroom as best you can. Next slide. Okay, what about alternative medicine approaches? If this is really popular, up to 60% of women try some kind of alternative medicine or herbal approach to treating menopausal symptoms. So what actually works? So relaxation techniques, breath work and meditation techniques may to improve hot flushes and specifically the anxiety that comes along with the hot flush. Melatonin actually has been shown to improve insomnia if it's part of a whole sleep routine. So just popping the pill at night is not going to necessarily help, but it can be an important part of a whole sleep hygiene routine around going to bed and going to sleep. And we do have good data that it's safe and there aren't untoward side effects if you follow the guidelines of whatever product that you're taking. These other products that lots of people try, so soy, isoflavones, vitamin E, black cohosh, all these other things that are marketed around hot flushes and sleepiness and mood for menopause. Um, when we've looked at them in trials, they work just as well as Tic Tacs. So there's something called the placebo effect. Anything that you take for hot flushes will make them better by about 40%. So none of these herbs seem to work better than that. 
and there's not a lot of safety data around them. So I would really caution any use of those herbal preparations without talking to your doctor. Next slide. All right, so talking about sleep, I'm gonna give a shout out to the next uh, event in June. This is a super important topic and to hear an actual sleep expert talk about it would be gold. So log in and listen to that. But there's something called cognitive behavioral therapy where you work with a therapist to literally train your brain to go back to sleep, to train your brain to wake up, realize it's the middle of the night and roll over and go back to sleep and not lie awake all night. It actually in trials works as well or better as any medication we can prescribe. And the excellent thing is there's no side effects and no safety concern. So for someone who's really struggling with insomnia, I strongly encourage you to find a psychologist who specializes in this. It's a sort of a special certification because it works as well as anything else we know. If you do need medication, we often use benzodiazepines like Valium. That's fine for occasional use. If you're using it more than three times a week, it's habit forming and you need to talk to your doctor about trying something else. The other medications are things like Ambien and Lunesta. They are the non-habit forming medications. They are also fine as a temporary fix for a couple of months, but we don't have safety data on the long-term use. So if you've been using those regularly for more than a couple months, again, you need to talk to your doctor about alternatives. Next slide. All right, this the whole slide is just screenshot it. These are the non-hormonal prescription medications that we can use that improve hot flushes. Many of them also treat, um, uh, some treat moodiness, some treat chronic pain if you have that from surgery. This is something to take a picture of and take to your doctor, and you and your doctor can decide which one of these medications may work best for you. But these are prescription medications with excellent data that they work well to treat hot flushes particularly. Next slide. All right, late effective menopause I wanted to highlight is something called the genitourinary syndrome of menopause. What this really is is vaginal dryness. So the longer a woman is without hormones, her reproductive tract starts to atrophy, meaning the lining of the vagina starts to get thin and friable and fragile. And this can cause a feeling of dryness, even as just walking down the sidewalk. It can cause painful sex. It can impact how frequently you need to pee. You can have pain with peeing. You can have blood with peeing. You can get chronic infection. This is a problem that we can solve. Next slide. Okay, so on the lifestyle side, what if you are suffering from these symptoms, the first thing you need to do is eliminate every irritant that your reproductive tract comes into contact with. So that's gonna be body soaps. Any body wash with perfume should be taken out of your bathroom. Also think about laundry soap. Laundry soap is some of the most caustic chemical we ever come in contact with. So for your underwear, use things like Woolite or Dreft, which is the laundry soap we use for newborns. But take all the irritants away from your from your uh, pelvic area. Lubrication is really about use it or lose it. So you need to th maybe think about some stimulation. If you are smoking, here is reason number 878 to stop smoking. And think about infection prevention, bacteria like warm, dark, moist places. So think about cotton underwear and breathable undergarments. If you want to use an herbal product for this, there is a long list on this slide of things that may work. They don't really work that well, but there are things that people try. They can improve some of the tissue flexibility, but they don't really improve the lubrication. Next slide. Okay, here's the slide of things that work. And again, this is for you guys to screenshot. So again, avoid all alcohols and perfumes. When you're looking for products to use in your vaginal area, read the back of the label and avoid anything that has an alcohol or a perfume. You use moisturizers just to keep things moist for maintenance. So every two to three days, you want it to mimic your, your normal vaginal secretion. So there's a product that does that. There's a product called Reverie. I'm going to call out specifically for breast cancer survivors. This hyaluronic acid works really well um, and has no hormonal impact. So um, it's marketed as Reverie. Again, I don't work for this company. I don't make any money. And this isn't an endorsement from Hogue. This is just my experience as a clinician. This is one to check out if you're having these issues. So in addition to moisturizers, if you're gonna be having intercourse, you might need a lubrication. So here are a whole bunch of products on the market and things to keep in mind. You want things that are silicone-based, not water-based, because the silicone-based will last longer. 
Glycerin-based lubricants can exacerbate a yeast infection. So those products you wanna think about if you're having chronic infection, be careful with. If you like the idea of, going, of staying in your pantry, olive oil and coconut oil work well. Um, however, if you're having a recurrent infections, talk to your gynecologist because sometimes they can make them worse. And if you do not, if you're not in a monogamous relationship, here's a plug for using condoms to protect yourself against sexually transmitted infections, but also think about which lubricant you can use safely that doesn't cause the condom to break. Another thing I'm going to put on your radar is if you have had long-term pain with sexual intercourse, you may have developed some pelvic floor tightness, which is a natural response to pain. That is well treated by pelvic floor physical therapy. So that is often a problem that people think they just kind of have to grain and bear and you really don't. There are these wonderful physical therapists that can treat this and teach your pelvic floor to relax again. And if you're having that problem, please talk to your gynecologist because we can help you with that. Next slide. All right, so there we go. Those are my tips and pearls for managing menopause. Thank you, Dr. Khan, for the opportunity to go through this. And I'll be happy to answer any questions at the end of the talk. Thank you so much, Heather. That was amazing. What a wonderful talk with some, some great tips. I'm sure they're very helpful for all of our patients that are tuning in. Um, for everybody who enjoyed the talk, please, um, if you have questions, make sure you're entering them into the um, chat box so that we can um, have Dr. McDonald available to answer any of your questions. Um, I'd love to invite Amy to give her uh, fitness demonstration. And um, shortly after that, we'll start our question and answer session. Welcome to Hoag Healing. My name is Amy Holcomb and I'm the Pilates instructor here at Hoag for Her Center for Wellness. Today, I will be sharing with you a few of my fitness tips for the new year and I will also demonstrate how you can improve your overall posture, energy level during and after your cancer treatments. The first exercise we will be doing will be a stretching exercise that will help build up flexibility in the upper body. It'll also improve your posture. If you have rounded shoulders, it'll open up your collarbone more so you feel a little bit more comfortable throughout your day. You will start by placing your hands right at your side, right along your thighs, and all you're gonna do is press back a couple inches and then release. And press back and release and allow the shoulders to open up as you press the arms back, which will look like this from a side view. You will stand up nice and tall and just a couple inches and then release and press back and release. And the next exercise you're gonna do with your arms straight out right at your side, you're gonna lengthen them through the shoulders and extend your fingertips so you're trying to reach in opposite directions. And then you're gonna draw small circles forward, about a count two or three, four or five counts, depending on your body. And then you're gonna reverse the, shoulder, the circles, the arm circles. And you're gonna take your time, deep inhale through the nose and deep exhale out the mouth, let it all go. And after you do this one, now we're raising our wrists above our shoulders and we're gonna draw our hands up to the sky and then let them go back down. And inhale and draw your arms all the way up to the sky, reaching and lengthening. And then draw your elbows down at your side. You're gonna bring your elbows in towards the center line of your body and then open them up and draw them in and open, and in, and open. And the last exercise we're gonna do, we're going to incorporate our hands. So the more we squeeze with a firm fist, we can inc we'll incorporate our arms and our muscles in the arms. So after we do the arm circles and the up and down with the arms, trying to release the pressure under the arms and around the shoulders, you're going to extend the hands all the way up to the ceiling and squeeze and release and squeeze and release. And you can also draw circles with the wrists and then reverse the circles. So all of these exercises are really good to improve your flexibility. 
if you want to add strength to the exercises that you just did, you can take a few free weights. My recommendation would be to start out with one pound weights and slowly work your way up to about three to five pound weights. The one pound weights will feel extremely heavy at first, even though they're one pound. So just take your time and listen to your body and you hold, hang on to the free weights and place them right at your side and then do the entire stretch series that you did with your arms using the hand weights. And then you, you will also improve the strength in your arms, upper body and back muscles. So standing up nice and tall, I'll do all of these about two to three times just to give you an idea. So you want to extend your fingertips down towards the ground, inhale through the nose and push back gently, hold, isolate the muscle and then release and push back and release and one more back and release and then arms out to your side, palms facing the ground and you can draw small circles forward or back. It doesn't matter which position you start in and then release and go back. Listen to your body. Again, this might be a little too much. If you recently had any type of injury into your chest area, you only want to use your hands. And after you draw the circles, then you can go here, gold post, 90 degrees with your arms and reach up towards the sky. And then lower down and reach up towards the sky and lower back down and reach up towards the sky. And then the last one will be to draw your elbows in towards the center line of the body and then open up your arms to the outside and draw them in and open and in and then back open. So feel free to use the weights. However, if you feel that your body is starting to get fatigued, take a break and go back to the exercise. Break up the exercises throughout your day. You don't have to do them all at once. After you finish working your upper body, we're gonna move down to the core area and I'm gonna show you a few of my favorite exercises that you can do at home. You can do this on the couch while you're watching TV during a commercial break. You can do this while you're sitting at a park waiting to meet with somebody. You can do this exercise anywhere you go as long as you have a supported chair or couch to sit on. This next and final exercise demonstration is to improve the overall strength in your core, which is your abdominals and your obliques that wrap around into your back muscles. You can take a, you can use a Pilates prop, such as a TheraBand, but while I'm at home, I like to just grab a hand towel. So grabbing a hand towel, extend your arms straight out in front of you, give a nice deep inhale through the nose, and lift the arms up above and then exhale all the way down. Taking your time is the key. Don't go too fast or else you will lose the muscle. Inhale up and exhale down. And once again, inhale back up and exhale all the way down. We will add a rotation onto this exercise by extending the arms straight out. Your wrists are gonna be lined up with your shoulders and inhale, rotate towards the right side, keeping those hips forward. Your shoulders are gonna follow, but your arm is not gonna cross over your sternum. Keeping your head right lined up with your midline. And then, so it's gonna be about three to four inch move, movement. And then deep inhale through the nose and exhale back to center. And we'll do that on the other side. Inhale through the nose and exhale back to center, inhale to the other side, and exhale back to center. And you have to even it out, so do it on the other side. Make sure you even them out when you do your counts, and back to center. I recommend doing these exercises a couple times a day. If you have low energy, just do one or two in the morning, one or two in the evening, and build it up throughout your week. And my final fitness tip for the day will be to remind you that whatever you do throughout your day, try to stay active and mobile, even if it's for 20 minutes, and slowly build up to an hour, if you can, break it up in 15 increments throughout the day. And lastly, allow physical fitness 
to be a part of your cancer program before, during, and after your treatment. Thank you for listening to me today. Again, my name is Amy Holcomb, and have a safe, healthy, and happy day. Great. So those were some wonderful tips from Amy. I'd like to invite our two speakers so that we can um, start our question and answer um, session. We have some um, questions already from the audience. For those of you who were just paying attention um, and haven't had a chance, please enter any questions you have in the chat for our two wonderful speakers. Um, some important tips um, for two very important topics. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and just get started with some of the questions that have been submitted. Um, uh, so thank you both again for being here with us tonight. Um, we really enjoyed both of the talks and the presentations. Um, so I'll start with you, Amy. Um, we have a question from the audience. Um, one of the patients um, mentioned specifically that she had breast implants placed for reconstructive surgery. And she wants to know, um, she's felt pretty uncomfortable since having her um, surgery. Are there particular um, exercises that she can do that would help her feel a little bit more comfortable um, having or knowing that she's had the implant-based reconstruction? Thank you. That's a great and very common question that I'm asked with my clients that have implants. What I highly recommend is to in, start by improving your flexibility Start with a very gentle and mild range of motion and slowly work your way up. Do a range of motion throughout the upper body, the arms. And once you improve the flexibility, then eventually you can do some strength training exercises that should improve your posture muscles as well. As long as you have your doctor's permission to do these exercises. Great. Perfect. Thank, Thank you so much, Amy. Um, so the next question is for you, Dr. McDonald. Um, so one of the patients is asking, um, you know, and I think this is a super common question that I get all the time as well, but is there something they can do to help with vaginal dryness and how do they make that better? So thank you. And I'm actually thrilled to hear that that's a question you get asked because I think a lot of women are shy and they're, they're not comfortable raising it as, a, as an issue. Either they're uncomfortable talking about it or they feel like there's really nothing to do. So there's no point in talking about it. And um, we actually can, can do quite a bit. So um, the first thing I would, I would have a patient do is think about all of the, the things that her vaginal area is exposed to. Vaginal dryness actually is usually a combination of severe irritation and dryness. So we want to take all the irritants away. Um, I mentioned before soaps, body washes, laundry soaps. I can't over um, emphasize how important it is to reduce all of that exposure. Um, just, just sort of in washing underwear. Um, doesn't have to be your entire laundry, um, but body washes, anything with perfume is actually really unnecessary and uh, pretty irritating. And then I, I showed a list of several products. There was one that I highlighted, the hyaluronic acid, which is marketed um, currently as a product called Reverie. It actually um, restores the moisture to the tissue. So it's not just adding, you know, like adding hand lotion to your skin. It actually starts to restore the, most, the, the moisture that's actually in the tissue itself. Um, so I think that's a good place to start. And again, I don't work for this company. I don't make any money on this just as a, an experience. Um, it's also for women who are cleared by their doctor to use some vaginal estrogen. It really works well with vaginal estrogen. That plus vaginal estrogen is like one plus one equals four. So if you and your doctor have decided that's the right thing for you to do, um, I would consider adding that product to that. Um, and then if the vaginal dryness is really, um, really bothersome, and unfortunately for someone who gets to the point that even walking can be painful, do see your gynecologist because there are other con gynecologic conditions that can cause this that you need to be tested for. Um, and then, like I said, there are other prescription medications that you and your gynecologist may decide is safe for you to try. 
Yeah, I think I've actually heard of, of that medication from patients as well and um, a good success rate from, from using it. So I've actually had similar experience. So thank you so much for that um, information. Okay, I'm going to go back to Amy. Um, is there, um, there's a question on um, just how do I even start an exercise program? Do you have recommendations? Um, sometimes patients are just paralyzed, just, you know, they're trying to recover and really um, there's a lot of pain associated with that, but is there anything that you would um, kind of recommend as far as how to start up a good exercise program and to keep it regular? Yes, thank you. Great question. Along with your doctor's permission, the day after surgery, you can start with walking. It is very essential. It'll help to improve your sur overall circulation on a very mild way, and it will also help ease the tension and stress levels, gentle range of motion movements you can do, and also deep breathing exercises. In all of my Pilates sessions, I the first basic element of Pilates I go through with my client is basic breathing and how to breathe properly during exercises. And I always recommend that when you breathe, in order to breathe deeply through your abdominals, it's good to breathe about four deep inhales through your nose and then about five to six deep exhales out the mouth. So that'll all, that will allow the lateral breathing through your abdominal muscles in a gentle way. So these are the three main exercises that I recommend clients, patients starting the day after surgery, as long as the doctor says it's okay. And then they can slowly work their way up to a great healthy program. Yeah. Thank I think those, those tips are important. We'd always recommend for patients to start walking, um, right after breast surgery. So, I, and I think it kind of prevents a lot of issues down the line and can prevent blood clots. But um, obviously, as you said, check with your doctor based on your surgery, but for breast surgery, usually that's um, a pretty safe bet. So mm -hmm. thanks for those tips. Okay, Dr. McDonald, um, I have a question uh, for you. Um, so a patient asked why they are having issues with sleep since they've had surgery. Um, it, what's the reason why I'm having you know this issue? So um, you can tell I love talking about sleep and I, it's so critical to your health, your mental health and so many things. And everyone knows that if you have a sleep disturbance, you know, very quickly, we all start to feel a little nutty. Um, sometimes it's due to menopause. So the changes of sleep that are related to menopause are you cannot go back to sleep when you're awoken in the middle of the night. And what we know about sleep is that um, that has two phases in the night. And if you wake up in the middle of the night and don't go back to sleep, you literally only get half the sleep that you need. And that's why you don't feel rested. So um, sleep hygiene is actually an important thing. And I described it earlier, but that is something to pay attention to. Number one culprit now are screens in the bedroom. Um, it often isn't a, a change around surgery. Uh, you can't get comfortable. Most of us don't sleep flat on our back. And after breast surgery and pelvic surgery, you often can't sort of curl up on your side or your stomach the way that you're comfortable. So often sleep is disturbed just because of that. There's, of course, pain. Sometimes people are waking up in the middle of the night to either pee or take medications related to their surgeries. Um, so medical treatments themselves and surgeries just disrupt our sleep. And then what happens is literally we get out of the habit of sleeping. Um, and it's like your body kind of forgets. So those of us who have children, the cognitive behavioral therapy technique really feels like you're sleep training yourself the way we used to sleep train children. But you, you literally train your brain to go back to sleep. It's what you try and teach a toddler. It's dark outside the window. Don't yell for mommy. Just roll over and go back to sleep and you'll see her when the sun comes up. We're kind of teaching our brains to do the same thing. And the fascinating thing is when you do neuroimaging on women who are doing this cognitive behavioral therapy, they actually change the electronic pathway in their head into a pattern that fosters sleep. So it's really powerful. Um, it's a commitment. It's like a 14 week course you do with a psychologist, but I can't emphasize enough how helpful it can be. The final thing I wanna throw in is acupuncture can be really helpful for hot flushes and sleep. There is good data for both um, sleep and hot flushes around acupuncture. So women who are suffering from that combination Acupuncture can be a good place to start, um, and many insurances are starting to cover it now, so it's it's definitely worth checking out. Yeah, I mean, I'll make a quick comment. I mean, I, you know, 
I noted, I had read about the screen time and that, that there's something specific about the light from your phone or your iPad or whatever your um, laptop that you're using at night. And it's, it completely like disrupts your sleep and wakes you up more than you think. And, you know, you yeah. can't, you know, think of how many times if your phone's right next to you, you like touch it and you look at it and you're like, Oh, I got a message or I got an email. And I noticed when I put my phone on the opposite side of the room, I just like slept so much better. So. Yep. And for many of us, we like to read at night for many of us reading is part of our, um, of our routine. And it can be, if you're, I mean, you kind of, you have to go old school. You actually have to get the book out. Um, Kindles actually are a little better, but any kind of backlit screen, that light is actually stimulating your brain. It's doing the opposite of what you want it to do. So if you enjoy reading at night, which I do, that's a good technique, but you really have to get the old book out and like hold it in your hand with the light over your shoulder. And that will actually help you wind down rather than wind up. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay. So Amy, I have um, one more question for you. Uh, the question is, um, how much weight bearing exercises can my body handle and how do I determine that once I've had surgery? Again, once you had surgery with your doctor's permission, you want to start out with no weight bearing exercises, no restriction, no resistant bands and slowly progress and work your way up by using, I recommend one increment weights. So slowly building yourself up. If you feel any pain or tension in the area that you're working, then go back to no weight bearing exercises and just stretching. So you want to build your exercise program up extremely slowly. You can start adding weight bearing exercises if it's okay with your doctor about eight weeks, six to eight weeks after the surgery. Okay, great. Um, I have another question for you, Amy, since um, we're already talking. Um, one of the questions um, is uh, I've had um, breast reconstruction and I've had a few fills um, with our, my plastic surgeon and I got pain. Um, would it be helpful to do stretching um, in the mornings before they see their plastic surgeon? Um, before you answer, I think probably for this very particular question, I'll, I'll go ahead and just answer for you, Amy, but it sounds like those patient, that patient should definitely be checking with their doctor, usually in that first few weeks um, or a few months right after surgery, your plastic surgeon will definitely not want you doing any sort of new exercises or different exercises. So they're going to be really the best person to help you figure out if your pain is normal, if the feelings that you're feeling are part of what you should be feeling with the fill from your reconstruction and probably just to get the okay from your doctor before you do any stretching or, or new types of exercises. Do you think that's pretty fair, Amy? Absolutely. Because something can be happening inside that the doctor needs to check and possibly fix. Um, so I would not recommend anything for my client to do other than to see their doctor, even housework, um, anything, anything lifting or moving or shifting you have to be very careful. So I highly recommend stopping any housework um, and maybe even having somebody help you get dressed and um, uh, wash your hair and everything that causes you to have to lift your arms up. Yeah, especially with breast reconstruction, I think our, our reconstructive surgeons are very particular about um, activity and movements and they'll go over all of those things with you. Um, okay, so going back to Dr. McDonald, um, is it okay to use gummies for sleep? Um, and then tell me about melatonin. Is that helpful? Um, should I be doing that after surgery? Okay, so excellent questions. I'm gonna start with the gummies. I'm assuming that we're talking about THC gummies. Um, and I will share with you, there's not great scientific studies around that. Um, however, personally, I do know patients where that has been really helpful. I would ask a patient to think carefully what they are treating with that. If you're having a hard time falling asleep, um, that certainly can be, a can be about surgery and discomfort, um, but sometimes for having a hard time falling asleep is more about anxiety and depression. If it's that you can't get your body comfortable, then maybe the gummies will help. If you're anxious because you've had a cancer operation, um, that's understandable, but then you wanna think about how you're treating that. THC gummies can be an important part of that treatment, but you definitely wanna be talking to your doctor. If you're anxious enough that you're taking something like that, your doctors need to be aware. And it may be 
an occasional, you know, occasionally using a, a gummy might be fine, but you might need something a little stronger and a little longer acting. The problem with using some of those over the counter medications is that you end up on a roller coaster. They're helpful for a couple hours and then they wear off. And if you're having that problem, then you actually need a prescription medication that evens you out for a longer period of time. So I think occasional use is fine. If it's regular use, I would talk to your doctor, um, mostly because we wanna make sure that that's really the most effective thing you can have. But we also need to know what, all of what patients are taking, including all the herbal products, including THC products, because we wanna make sure that nothing interferes with the medications that you're on. So super important to be communicating with your doctor. Quick comment about melatonin. Melatonin is a naturally occurring hormone in your brain that helps you wind down at night and go to sleep. So you can take it over the counter as a supplement. You wanna be careful whenever you get your supplements from that it's a reputable source. So don't, I would be careful about, you know, buying it from a company you've never heard of. There are places like CVS Drugstore and Whole Foods that are very careful about where they source their herbal products from. So it's probably safest to get it from a source like that. Um, melatonin is trying to mimic that natural hormonal surge in your brain that puts you to sleep. So it really only works if it's part of an entire sleep routine. It is not a sleeping pill. If you take one because you want to go to sleep every now and then, it won't work. It needs to be part of that whole sleep hygiene thing I talked about. But at used that way, yes, it can be very helpful. Paradoxically, sometimes it can cause people to have weird dreams. And if you notice that's happening, then you don't want to take melatonin and you do want to talk to your doctor. Oh, yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Um, another question, I'll go ahead and just field this question. Um, one of our um, questions was related to depression after surgery um, and how that can be managed. I think probably to address that, um, the best thing would be first, obviously contacting your doctor to let them know what you're experiencing, let them try to figure out if this is just something that's temporary related from surgery and things that we can do to help um, you know, manage um, what you're feeling. A true diagnosis of depression, depression really needs to come from a provider because it, it isn't usually related to just some big change as far as like a surgical change, but could be um, other things in your life um, and other parts of your life as well. But I think it's a really important question. We have some wonderful resources. So if you reach out to your physician's office, I'm sure they'll want to address it with you and give you resources of who might be able to help um, as far as like counseling um, some um, social workers. There's a lot of different resources, especially at Hope for, for managing this. So um, definitely let your doctor know. I think they're a great resource. Um, we've had some two wonderful talks and um, we're gonna try to wrap up because I know there's another um, YouTube live. So patients might wanna be logging on to that as well. Um, thank you so much, Amy and Dr. McDonald. Um, we had a wonderful um, event and we would love to get everybody's feedback. So please look out for the newsletter email that you're gonna get and click on that little link that says, take our survey. And we'd love to hear how, how you enjoyed our event and our speakers and anything you'd like to hear about. And then mark your calendar for June 9th for our talk on sleep and also um, having our dietitian give us um, some tips. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. We really hope you enjoyed um, our, our talks and our event and um, we can't wait to hear your feedback. Have a good night, you guys. Thank you.